Um, okay, so um, I'm giving you a trials parade very fast. Uh, I'll go much faster, Sven. Uh, in the lipidology area, uh, where well, the first statement is that I'm not a lipidologist, but I'm a clinical trialist of note, and uh, as a scientist. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, oh, I see, I can do this. Thank you. Okay, so when we talk about lipidology trials for the next 15 minutes, uh, we should just mention there are several challenges. And the challenges are that we really have the problem with the pathophysiology. Do we really understand the targets? Are we looking at LDL, HDL, apolipoproteins, others? There's so many things to talk about. Uh, we, I'm not sure if we know what we're doing. That what is the exact relationship between all these targets, but then with the disease in the vessel and the cardiovascular outcome events? It's also very, very... Uh, uh, interesting, but there are time discrepancies. You may have to have a lifetime of uh, uh, li proper lipids or bad lipids. Uh, vascular changes come later, and outcome events may depend on other stuff too. So it's very complicated, the arrangement. And surrogate endpoints are therefore plasma lipids, plaque volume. What do we look at? The extent of disease? Can they guide us in the, our early, perhaps, phases of drug development or not? And what is the comparative? Because everything's moving so fast. I mean, now you're doing a trial and then uh, everything looks fine. You've got a new way of treating LDL. And suddenly you realize, oh, there's a new drug out there. People are injecting uh, Evolocumab. So now it's not relevant what you've been looking at if you're not up to date. So um, we're going to run through some of these things with that in mind. First group. Of, LDL uh, centered studies, then HDL, then triglycerides, and some others. Okay, the LDL concept. This is the basis of the LDL uh, concept. The lower the LDL, or the greater the reduction in LDL, the lower, the, the better the chance you have of reducing the clinical event rate and improve it, which was a great study that you'll all remember took about seven or eight years or nine years of including the planning, uh, showed that. Um, the lower, the better. 50 is better than 70 in terms of event, lower event rates, and it falls exactly on the right line. And um, uh, uh, that was the first, perhaps, modern study pointing out that it's a non-statin drug that had a significant effect on outcome. Now there's some others. Okay, so from there we move to Fourier, the uh, uh, PSSK9 inhibitor. Uh, this is what Fourier essentially showed. Uh, this was the um, placebo arm of Fourier. This was the uh, Evolocumab arm. 59% uh, uh, reduction, absolute 56 milligrams per deciliter. The primary endpoint, which is uh, too broad in my opinion, but it wasn't my vote, uh, was significant by 15% risk reduction. The classic triple endpoint that's used in most uh, outcome trials of cardiovascular death, MI or stroke, 20% uh, reduction in outcome and a 2% absolute percentage points thing. Now, what did we learn from Fourier? You've all seen this. But I think for me, there are a few messages. One is we said, again, lower is better. And when you look at this curve, again, of the blue is the placebo arm, the red or the locking by quartile of uh, based on LDL, clearly, again, the lower you are, the better the, you get, the, the better the results. So now we learn from Fourier that. Uh, well, it seems 30 is probably better than 50. And that's after 50 was better than 70, and 70 was better than 90. And I'm just wondering uh, if 10 is going to be better than 30, and probably the answer may well be yes. Interesting thing is the major adverse limb events. We have to find something for to add an FE in front, so we will not be accused of sexism here. Uh, but uh, the um, major adverse limb events, I can just say, was coined by a lady called Sonia Anand. So a, a lady selected the male acronym. So I think we're OK. And um, this was the results of the um, PAD patients in terms of acute limb ischemia, amputations, urgent vascularization. And this is all the patients. If we look at them in two groups, these are people who had no known PAD when they got into this. They got in with the coronary events, but, it, but people who had not had known PAD nonetheless had f developed fewer adverse limb events, a huge almost 70% reduction. So if you have coronary disease and uh, you're in the Fourier trial and there's nothing wrong with your legs, some people are going to develop leg problems, but far fewer if, you, if you're getting Evolocumab. Now, we are going to see, oh, the Ebbinghaus sub-study showed that there was no neurocognitive 
uh, function, but it's a very difficult to measure cure neurocognitive function, so it's a risk reassuring. Um, the Fourier was published. We're going to see the Odyssey results in uh, hopefully in March. Uh, it will be at the ACC in Orlando. The uh, Fospire one and two Boco drug by Pfizer has been abandoned because of, we all know there were problems with uh, uh, how well it would um, it, it would maintain its effect without uh, antibodies and the like. So we left with one ongoing or completed now study that will hopefully um, add to our data. These are slightly different patients, but it will complement our information on uh, PCS kind inhibitors. You don't want to base everything on one study. Okay, next. PCSK9 can also be inhibited by uh, different mechanisms. Inclizoran is uh, the study of Orion-1, uh, pushed by uh, Kelsey Gray very strongly. Uh, this is very interesting because the uh, a PCSK9 synthesis inhibition via RNA interference. So basically, uh, here's your double strand. You take a molecule, you modify it so that it has hepatic specific uptake. It's chemically modified to prevent RNA's degradation. A dice separates antisense strand and incorporates it into risk. Risk meaning RNA-induced silencing complex. And so you silence your RNA, you do not produce PCSK9, and when you use, when when uh, you use this this drug, what happened? It looks like you, when you use this drug, you switch off your slides. But uh, this was all I was hoping for to show that one injection or two injections may last for a long period of time, six months or a year. Now we have where's uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Industry Amgen <laughs> uh, uh, people. An interesting concept that what's going to happen is that you could come once a year, maybe on your birthday, and you will get your shot of a drug that will fix your cholesterol for the next year. Uh, maybe we can expand this concept with this sort of uh, mechanism that you come for a shot on your birthday or any other day you choose once a year, maybe first of January or Christmas or whatever you, you choose, and then you now have no cholesterol problems for the next year, and we take the responsibility from the patient to the physician, which is very important in terms of compliance. And if we can do this for diabetes and other diseases, it may change the way that uh, we practice medicine. So this to me is extremely interesting, perhaps even more so than the fact that we inhibited PCS canine, the long-acting approach. Of course, you may say for the company, that's why I asked where he is, how is this costed? Because if you're only selling one dose in a year, I mean, you know, you're not doing much business, are you? But this is going to be a very interesting study, and they're now planning a phase three large study to see what happens. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about in LDL is an upstream blockage of it. Statins inhibit the HMG-CoA, uh, we all know that, for many years. There's a drug called bimpedoic acid, which is converted to a coenzyme derivative, which directly inhibits something up there. It's, there's an upstream block in the uh, cholesterol synthesizing pathway, may be useful when people are statin intolerant uh, as an alternative. There is a company are developing this, there's a study going, uh, I don't know when it's finishing, maybe somebody else in the audience was updated, but it's going to be another interesting way of reducing LDL. Okay, let's do a few words about HDL. Now, there's a whole business here of the HDL, the CETP inhibitors. We all know that the CETP inhibitors, torcetrapib, was abandoned because it had off-target effects, increased mortality. Dalcetrapib uh, was abandoned because we had a huge increase in HDL. Well, not so huge, 25 30%, but there was no benefit. Now there's a concept is maybe we didn't target the right patients. So the Dal gene study is looking, if you had a certain gene makeup, this is uh, what you call a... Uh, uh, precision medicine, maybe you have the correct genes to block and something's going on and you use this drug, maybe there will be a benefit. Don't know. There's an ongoing study called Dal gene right now. Uh, Evocetropeb was abandoned. Anacetropeb as well had this huge increase in HDL, also a 30% reduction in LDL, the real study showed that there was a difference as a paper from uh, uh, the, the, the actual paper from the uh, revealed study. Uh, there is a difference. It's not huge when you look at it on the scale of 100, but it is significant. It's about 10% less, 9% less. The company have notified they are not going to go to the market with this drug, but I do not think it's justified in the age of uh, PCSK9 inhibitors to go and look for the small benefit. But it's an interesting concept is that they lowered LDL by 
um, 30%. It's not a statin. It also had benefits. So it does not have to be a statin. Another, another, another alternative. OK, a few words about epigenetics. Uh, Resvologics is a company based out in California, I think, who have developed a drug that uh, sits in there and modifies gene expression with the concept that the you know, genetic double strand is the hardware, but the, um, the, the, uh, we can modify the software, which uh, uh, in a way that looks like too good to be true, uh, downgrades inflammation improves reverse cholesterol transport and, and improves their HDL profile, uh, has positive effect on platelet activity. The two, all the wish list is in the style. Now, the study is called uh, Bet on Mace. Uh, right now, I can tell you, uh, this is not updated, but there were 2,400 patients were estimated to be, uh, by a power calculation, to be required to show an effect, uh, a significant effect. Uh, when there are now 2,300 and something patients recruited expected to end in the next month or two, and then within the next year we will have results. Very interesting, following the Cantos study, was one of the things here was that this is an, it modifies inflammatory markers, and we're going to see that. By different mechanism, totally. Okay. Um, this is Mark Gibson's study on the Aegis group. Um, this is some Febrile artery on placebo, and this is with infusions of apolipoprotein A1, human apolipoprotein A1. Mike Gibson, uh, I'm quoting because he said it's like vacuuming your uh, endothelium. You vacuum out the plaques and you suck out the lipids. And the idea is that you, uh, you, by infusing the proper apolipoprotein, you can clean up the arteries. And this is important in the early days after MI, before the statins and all the other stuff can kick in. So the um, Aegis 1 study showed that, first of all, the drug is safe. There were some concerns whether it's a human product that could, might cause liver or kidney damage. That does not happen. Um, there was a signal in the early stage that if you look at events, no power, but there was maybe this notch in the curve there. And so the company are now starting the Aegis 2 study, which is going to be a um, um, phase 3, uh, 30, 40 country project to uh, uh, see if this is true, that there may be an early decrease in repeat events by rapidly cleaning up your arteries in the acute phase, whatever that means, after an acute coronary event. The study uh, protocol is just being finalized. Recruitment will start in about three months' time. You have to wait a couple of years then before you get a result, but it's another interesting concept. Now, we do know that uh, this is the Aegis group. APA A1 Milana has been disappointing on the same concept. Another study, probably slated uh, 2017 carrot, also infusions of a different kind of molecule aimed to clean out your arteries did not work out. Um, what, be that as it may, uh, the Aegis study is going ahead saying this is a better drug, they think it's a better molecule, and they're still confident that we may see a good result. Okay, triglycerides. Ah, this was downplayed. In the age of statins, everybody said, who cares about the triglycerides? We don't have a good drug anyway. But now uh, Kawa, who based in Japan, carefully tested uh, 1,000 com compounds which are supposed to have greater potency and PPA or alpha selectivity than a phenofibrate, which we know and hasn't done much. Well, maybe it has some effects, see? Uh, it has greater tears lowering, so on and so forth, less side effects. When they got to compound number 877 of their 1,000 molecules, only the Japanese could do this, one at a time, they decided that this one fit the bill. So they stopped their testing there, and we are now doing the prominent study with pimifibrit, which this drug is called. Uh, the study is randomizing people uh, in a one-to-one -one ratio who are pre-treated with all the best lipid management we know, including LDL. And the study is focused on diabetics, was they at the highest risk, with low HDL. So this is the high-risk population. The diabetics have this metabolic syndrome, what we call with diabetes, low HDL, high triglycerides. They're usually overweight. Their diabetes is usually not so well controlled. And we're now randomizing patients to treat them with this effective, supposedly, drug pemifibrate. It's going to be a three- or four-year study. I don't think we'll have results before 19, uh, sorry, 2019 or 2020, maybe even. Uh, that's how it's planned right now. So uh, watch the triglyceride market. It's also coming back to life. 
Last thing I'll talk about is NHPTL3. Um, where are we? Evan Acubab. This was uh, from the internet. The FDA grants breakthrough designation to this drug. Now, the drug is, what does it do, for those who haven't followed this? It's a monoclonal antibody. It's by, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, Regeneron, as far as I know. It's an antibody against NGPTL3, which is an inhibitor of lipoprotein lipase. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, you get more lipoprotein lipase activity, and therefore you reduce triglycerides, your, your lipid metabolism improves, and... Uh, uh, the lipids are supposed, are presumably the triglyceride levels increase very impressively. They also have data ongoing in homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, where they've seen remarkable results when this is combined with other uh, medications. Uh, uh, when we uh, were at the Venice meeting recently, P.K. Shah, actually from Los Angeles, who's been very involved in this, uh, had a good title for his talk. He called it, Is This Actually a Breakthrough or Another Step in the Path, or something like that. So we will have to wait and see as this uh, trial ongoing shows results, and we'll learn whether another mechanism altogether may be... Uh, may be useful in uh, patients with uh, uh, hyperlipidemia. Uh, this is just, there was some background data, we can go quickly. There's some good evidence why this might work. One is that people who've got uh, um, hereditary deficiencies in, uh, in the pathway, like, like the PCK9 inhibitors, it was discovered that families who have this uh, f um, uh, gen genetic type do much better. So that's same with the Nakibab study, is people who have the genetic build where they have this uh, inherently, they do very well. Also, you can do this in knockout mice. You can genetically in injure mice, and they do better. So if that all works, then it should work in humans when you give a drug that does the same effect. But there's always a lot of surprises in medicine. You have to do the study if you want to find out. So that's the um, lipidology uh, run-through. That's what's more or less what's going on. Uh, watch the uh, news uh, and the internet, and uh, we'll get some interesting data. Thank you.